Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our first ever fan commentary. And as you can see behind me, we're starting with the film Quigley Down Under from 1990. We have two hours to get into why, but let's not waste time. Uh, for those who haven't done this before, you're going to sync up this YouTube track with the movie as you watch. And I'll tell you exactly when to hit play. We'll do a little countdown, and then we'll have a counter in the corner of the screen the whole time so you can stay in sync. Uh, before we start, let me introduce my co-commentators. First, from our 1942 interview, the Jeopardy champ is here, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Carroll. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I could be here. Jim, this is our first commentary. Are you excited? I'm very excited. Look at me. Woo! I'm shaking. See? And from our 1988 review, as well as many other shows, please welcome our, the TV star from Gilmore Girls, Devin Michaels is here. Hello. Good to see you again. Devin, can you believe it? This is our first ever fan commentary. How did it take us this long? This is where we should be. Right? This, should, this, this could be a lot of fun. I'm very excited. The first time we've done this, we want to do it for a long time. To paraphrase Quigley himself, we don't know where this commentary is going, but there's no sense in being late getting there. Three, two, one, press play now. And before I let these guys share their thoughts, let me use the opening credits to give you guys some context on some of the folks both in front and behind the camera as they come up on the screen here. First, of course, you've got Tom Selleck. Magnum P.I. ended in 1988, and he was suddenly a viable box office draw after Three Men and a Baby in 1987. Incidentally, the sequel came out the same year as this film, Three Men and a Little Lady. His first film actually was in 1970, which is the year we're studying this year. It's a film called Myra Breckenridge, and he has a small role in that. And Lars San Giacomo, very much a star on the rise in 1990, having done Sex, Lies, and Videotape the year before, and a supporting role in Pretty Woman earlier in 1990. Alan Rickman was the bad guy du jour of the era after the massive success of his, one of our 1988 films that we studied, Die Hard, which I said in our 1988 review that he should have been Oscar nominated for that performance. He would be the delicious bad guy again the following year as the Sheriff of Nottingham and Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Next up with the wardrobe designer, Wayne Finkelman, who had a decent resume uh, with films like The Golden Child with Eddie Murphy, Overboard with Goldie Hawn, and a film from our 1988 review, Scrooged. And also two other films from 1990, uh, Bird in a Wire and the Chinatown sequel to Two Jakes. He did that as well. Um, the Bette Midler film for the boys is another he did. So his career was doing pretty well when he unfortunately passed away in 1994 at the age of 47 from the AIDS virus. Basil Poldoris, the composer, one of the bigger composers, late 80s, early 90s. He worked with Simon Winter a lot, the director. Poldoris did have another film in 1990, The Hunt for Red October. Adrian Carr, supervising editor, he also worked with Simon Winter a lot on his first film, Harlequin, also Daryl, 1985. Another Australian Western, The Man from Snowy River, in 1982. Ross Major, production designer. He's also an award-nominated costume designer. Most of the time, his production design work was in on Australian films. David Egby, the cinematographer. Born in Britain, he seems to have worked mostly in Australia, including on the original Mad Max. John Hill, the screenwriter, mainly known as a TV writer, won an Emmy as a producer in L.A. Law, wrote some of the better episodes of uh, Quantum Leap. This is actually one of the bigger films on Stanley O'Toole's resume, on which he's a main producer. Alexander Rose, however, is a producer. Her credits include the Oscar winner Norma Ray from 1979, Overboard with Goldie Hawn, and after this, the much maligned Exit to Eden, directed by Gary Marshall. And director Simon Winter, we're going to talk a lot about as the movie goes along, so we'll skip him. So I'll explain shortly why we chose this movie to do our debut fan commentary for. But first, let me bring in these other guys. Jim saw this movie 30 years ago and not since. Prepping for this yesterday, Devin saw it for the first time. Briefly, what did you guys think of Quigley Down Under? You know, I like the movie. I, I, you said that I saw it 30 years ago. Uh, I did. Um, I did not see it in the theater that I, I saw it uh, I saw it afterwards. Um, and uh, I, I honestly don't remember it. So seeing this again now is like seeing it for the first time. Like it was, and you, and, and you liked it in prepping for today. I did. I did very much like it. Um, it was it was sort of surprising to me. You know, it's, you watch it and it's sort of like a dream of like, oh, yes. Yes, I remember this. But uh, but uh, seeing it again sort of like with these fresh eyes, it was it was much better than I thought it would be. And uh, we just, here's a little nod to the Australia's history as a penal colony as we see some of these uh, uh, Brits, Irishmen, and Welsh Scots that have misbehaved come in. Devin, your turn. What did you think after seeing it for the first time yesterday? I was really charmed by this movie. I, I thought it was such a nice, simple, straightforward salve for our otherwise 
darker, more complicated times right now. I think this is a really great example of how a film doesn't have to be groundbreaking to be really, really good and just really enjoyable. And this accomplishes that. So I'm glad you guys really liked it. This could have gone either way, but so so it'll be a fairly uh, happy commentary, I think, which will be kind of fun. So that'll bring us to you know my reasons why this movie. First, why as far as its connection to the No Name Cinema Society, and so fans who watched our 1990 review or listened to it on, as we see another early crotch shot, a couple early crotch shots early in the movie, Jim. Um, I'm counting. But, <laughs> you, Only you Jim gets to hear about those. <laughs> <laughs> He's a crash shot expert, Jim. Fans who watched our 1990 review know why we would do a commentary on this movie. Uh, 1990 was the second year I ever did a top 10 list as, as a teenager, and this film topped the list back then. Now, I was young, and the movie made a significant impression on me then, which isn't nothing. But when we did our 1990 review, I didn't think it would crack the top 10 again, having watched all the other movies from 1990, but I did. I still enjoyed the film, and it fell in as number four. Uh, and when that happened, the others on the show, who aren't on the show anymore, Jay Money and Davey, said that they also really still enjoyed the film, and it was a surprise for them. It was also one of two films, along with Fred Shepsey's The Russia House, that I said I wanted to remake. And as the show went, al went along, uh, uh, it would come up as one of those unexpected surprises, like Punchline, for example, from the 1988 review, Devin. And Jim, I can't remember if there's an example from the 1942 interview. So it's one of those films that have come up a lot on the show and was one of the important rediscoveries in some ways from the 1990 review project from five years ago. And so now as we start doing commentaries, and these films are now 30 years old, it seemed an appropriate place to begin. And so that's the relation to the show. But why I personally think the movie is strong, I think it's a well-executed throwback Western without being a parody or with its tongue in its cheek, like, for example, Back to the Future Part 3, which also came out in 1990. Secondly, fans of the show know that a movie will get extra points for me if it's simultaneously entertaining and has something to say. So not only is the Western element of this well executed from a basic storytelling point of view, it also has something to say about masculinity, which is a topic common to the genre, racism and colonialism, which is also not too far into the genre, but also to some degree mental illness in a way that I think I personally found very moving and is a little unusual for the genre as, as we see Crazy Cora uh, in this fight right now. So guys, th those are the reasons that I enjoy the film. Uh, what, do you have any response to that? No, I, I mean, I think you hit uh, a lot of the, the really nice features of this, this movie. I especially agree with you that it is both entertaining and has something to say. And I think it does a good job of, uh, mostly a good job of splitting that up. Every time it has something to say, it breaks that up with like, here's another piece to move the action forward or something to to engage you in a different way. Right before this, uh, off camera, you, Jim, you had uh, mentioned to me you were surprised to learn that Steve McQueen was the original choice to play this role because it, it, the script was written in the 70s. Yeah, and then it didn't get developed for a, a really long time, I think, right? Yeah, the script was written in 1975 based on a 1974 article in the LA Times about colonial terrorism by the British and their treatment of the indigenous Australians. So it was originally bought back then for Steve McQueen to star in, but then he got really sick. Of course, he died young. Later on, Harrison Ford toyed with it after Raiders, but it, he felt it was too similar to Indiana Jones. They offered, they initially offered the role to Tom Selleck in 1985, but he had to turn it down because of Magnum. Uh, when the series ended in 1988, uh, he asked if the role was still available, and here we are. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's interesting. My general thoughts on liking the movie, aside from what you guys have already brought up, are directly related to the casting of Tom Selleck. There's something about choosing Selleck and the aesthetic that he brings. He's automatically got that sense of virtue. Uh, yeah. Just by being himself on screen, he, he, is, he is virtue. And there's something uh, that connects that in a way to the larger aesthetic of this film that they're committed to in such a straightforward way. These really nice, crisp, I mean, now we're in this dark scene, but just a few moments ago when we were seeing these big vistas and the, the really crisp colors and playful, simple visuals and the scoring that goes with that, definitely hearkening back to those earlier Westerns and committing to that in, in a way that's really satisfying. Yeah, and there's a couple things to unpack there because there's Tom Selleck, but there's also the Western. So I'm going to I'm gonna jump on the Tom Selleck uh, wagon for a second uh, because 
I agree with what you said. He's like a walking moral compass to some degree. Um, uh, forgetting, you know, for, for a moment, if we could, about Selleck's personal political le leanings off camera, I do think he has a certain charm and charisma that perfectly lends itself to the somewhat larger than life character. I wouldn't say it's an extraordinary or challenging performance, but I would say it's very successful. He very famously was the original choice to be Indiana Jones in Raiders of the Lost Ark, and he had to pass due to his Magnum contract. Through this character, I think one can see that we, though we wouldn't trade Harrison Ford in for anything, Selleck likely could have handled that role with aplomb. He handles the action in this movie, even at age 44, and the comedy very, very well, uh, and even the very nuanced romance. He's very believable as the archetypal stoic hero. It's funny because I also watched some old Selleck film performances to prep for tonight, and one that stood out was a 1979 film called Ramblin' Man, which isn't good, but he brings a lot of the same qualities to his character, even though he's a more modern cowboy in that film. It's very much about his charm, charisma, and strong sense of morality. Quigley is a little more well-rounded on the page, I think, and Selleck delivers that, and this might be one of his stronger performances in that regard in his career. But there's not much more than that to this character, uh, but not much more is required. Interestingly enough, uh, there's a line in the film Rambling Man in which Tom Selleck says, that's for sure and for certain. And that's a line that Quigley repeats several times in this film, but it came up in that film Rambling Man. This really is just terrific matching of an actor to a role. Like how no one else had ever thought of putting Selleck in this kind of role in this kind of movie is just beyond me. He was supposed to be Indiana Jones. I don't know if you know that story, but he was initially offered the role, was under contract to Magnum. You know, they cast Harrison Ford, but then Magnum shut down due to the writer's strike and Magnum wouldn't premiere until 1982 because of the writer's strike but Raiders would go on. So he actually was sitting on his butt waiting when he could have taken the role of Indiana Jones. And that would have changed everything. It's just that twist of fate that he didn't get that role. It worked out for the rest of us, I think. It's hard to imagine anyone but Harrison Ford in the role. Yeah, and it's interesting how this early in the film, before we really see too much of the relationship building, between these two main characters, there's already an interesting dynamic between them because of his stoic virtue, moral compass, and her kind of um, throwback archetype of uh, female craziness being associated with sexiness, right? And that's mm. all we know of her so far is she's crazy and sort of sexy. Um, and obviously it becomes so much deeper than that we see so much more later develop in terms of each of them as individuals, as well as their relationship, their unique connection. But it's interesting how even this early in the movie, we have those, those archetypes being built. And it goes along with, with this, this overall old school Western motif. We missed our chance to say the British are coming, the British are coming. No, no, we're going to say it next time. <laughs> This time we're going to do the British are leaving. Yeah, well, I, I, any, any second now. This scene I think is interesting because I think paralleling the evolution of America and Australia is very important to this film. And it comes up throughout. The scene points at it directly. Both countries, America and Australia, started out as British colonies and both had a brutal, adverse relationship with the natives. One could also include the American colonization of Hawaii as another parallel, as depicted in one of our 1966 films named Hawaii, based on the James Mishner book. And Devin, now you can say your line. The British are leaving. The British are leaving. <laughs> There's something there that's a little deeper in terms of, oh, look, the British are finally leaving. He is the <laughs> character that just basically told them to get lost. And it's interesting because it wraps up with this whole Western motif of, the newcomer, there's always in a Western, there is, there is a newcomer and otherwise it's this untamed country situation or this new town. And so here he is the newcomer from America, but he is in this parallel situation that you were just articulating about Australia also having been a British colony and then uh, having that negative relationship with the indigenous people. So he's here strangely a newcomer from the other country that represents that and yet he's this moral compass coming in and saying, you guys got to get lost. And also he comes from that original sin that America had just the same way Australia has it now.
This reminds me of this man I met years ago as a kid. My dad had worked for Joseph Noble at the Museum of the City of New York. He was getting some advice from him about where to take us one summer. He was going to take us to Australia. Joseph Noble said, don't take your family to Australia. If you've been to the American West, you've seen Australia. <laughs> I think there are very easy parallels between the Old West and the conquest of really, Australia. Really nice heroic dolly um, shot here. I don't mean to interrupt you, Jim, but I wanted to get during the, 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 that was a really nice slow track in on, on uh, Tom Selleck there that I thought was really nice that I wanted to call out. And I think this whole scene that we're about to see builds a relationship b between the two of them in a very non-traditional way. You know, he's about to turn down Laura San Giacomo. I'm not sure I would turn her down even in those circumstances, but so he's a better man than I. In so many ways, JB. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but no, I, I agree that this is an interesting dynamic because we don't normally have the love interest uh, being seated in this way. It's he's very much not thinking of her in that way, and it's not because it's not a romantic comedy. It's not that he's not considering her that way because oh, she's such a pain in the ass the way so many romantic comedies do that and vice versa, her thinking he's just a pain in the ass. It's neither of those things. It's just, they are coming at this situation from such vastly different places. And right now she's using him to fill in this thing from her past. And he is just trying to get his bearings on how he's gonna rectify this current situation. Well, Devin, I've not been to Australia, and, and in spite of all the desert, this movie makes me want to go. So I think you know, when this commentary comes out, we should all go celebrate by going to Australia. Jim, what do you think? Your your wife can do without you for a week, right? Yeah, yeah, she'll she'll be happy to get rid of me. I'm totally in for the trip. Yes, let's do it. I mean, I, I will say, I, I I honestly thought that um, the the movie was just shot in the in uh, you know somewhere off in the Hollywood Hills for a little bit. I was, I was very happy to see that it was on location, but it was, it's such a double for the American West. I do want to say something about Selleck's performance in this. We had touched on elements of it before, but we really, really talked about how relaxed he is. And I think the relaxation sort of lends itself to, to us believing that he's a professional, that he is supremely confident in what it is. And it's the, the fact that he is that relaxed and showing us that there's nothing to worry about in this new element really helps us get into that character too. It's definitely like makes him, helps to make him likable in that old Clint Eastwood kind of way. Cause Clint Eastwood, who was also a mercenary in some of his films, not, not that he's a, Quigley is, is a killer for hire per se, or he doesn't think he is anyway. There is this element of not, he doesn't say that much all the time. He doesn't necessarily need big speeches to, to get across who he is and what he stands for. And yeah, we like his, his stoicism I don't want to say charming, but it is an entree to the character. It certainly makes him a little more likable, don't you think, Jim? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it, it is a throwback into seeing these sort of, he's a hero. And um, in, in sort of an uncomplicated way, that reminds me of some of the older Westerns. We've seen some more complicated Westerns. We're about to see, you know, two years later, a really complicated Western that wins you know, best picture. And this yeah. is a nice sort of his own character, I think is kept pretty, pretty bare so that we can fill it with all of the, you know, all of our best attributes into him. Yeah. And we get no backstory or anything is we now have Alan Rickman here, uh, incidentally. And I just want to take a moment to point out some of the costume design here. Um, particularly the hat. Simon Windsor was, was very big about having everybody wear different hats because he feels like the hat shouldn't, the character should wear the hat, the hat shouldn't wear the character is, is one of his quotes uh, as relates to one of his other fil uh, films or telefilms, in this case, Lonesome Dove. Uh, this was, uh, I, I think there, everybody's wearing a different hat. As we see, even in writing, Matthew Quigley displays the quiet stoicism that's in keeping with many of the heroes of the genre. Um, and, I, and, then, and I know, that, go ahead, Devin. Yeah, and I also just, I love the, the specificity of these choices in terms of costume, uh, among other things, that Alan Rickman's character wearing a costume that almost precisely mimics Wyatt Earp's costume in both Wyatt Earp and Tombstone. Um, mm. that, that I, I don't think that's an accident. There, right. He's, he is playing that, um, 
that Although, side of I would things say, in terms of the law enforcement game in this town, in this right. region. And it was, it's, uh, of course, it's wearing man. black. Uh, I, my only thing is both those films came after this, but but but, but I see your point, certainly. Uh, um, I just mean in terms of, of the, the uh, I mean, it's possible those films specifically were referencing this, but I just mean, He's the no, you right. Wyatt Wyatt Earp throughout the. I mean, he's been in many films from the fifties. Uh, Gunfight Oakwood okay, Corral, My Darling Clementine from the forties. You know, so he's costume. Wyatt Earp is costume similarly in all those films. So, you're 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 not wrong. Um, I do want to take this time to talk about the gun itself because if the if the the film has a a little bit of a legacy and and a lot of it has to do with the with the the guns particularly Quigley's uh, rifle here. Um, the, 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 it's a sharps rifle and that, to many, uh, the, uh, that know the, know them, they're now called Quigley guns actually. And they've skyrocketed in sales, uh, almost immediately after the, the release of the movie. It almost had more, the film almost had more impact in gun sales than it did at the box office. Sell it. There's three rifles made for the film, uh, you know, duplicates, uh, and sell kept them, uh, and auctioned two of the three, uh, made for the film. At a fundraiser for the NRA, or as I like to call them, the NPA, the National Phallic Association, as if they needed the extra money. Uh, the third and final rifle can be, it's on display at the Brownell Family Museum, which is in uh, NRA Museum in New Mexico. Uh, so uh, just a little uh, input there on uh, what's going on, a little backstory about the guns themselves, which again uh, is part of the legacy of the film. Uh, as we get a really nice wide frame here and I, I love this frame and uh, and wide frames yeah. are a big part of the western history but this frame sort of tells the whole story uh you know without saying anything uh and, but also adding to the tension like everybody's in this frame it doesn't feel overly stagey i think it's it's really nice it's a beautiful shot and it's it's saying so much and it's also so pretty we're, we're also getting all those other elements of color and the other characters costumes even the even the lesser characters um while he's just taking his time and deciding what's what which is his his main mo now i said earlier that this was one of the films from 1990 that i wanted to remake which means we did an episode episode 26.4 in which i actually recast the film with modern actors so i want to see if you guys i, I don't want your opinions first i want to see if you have guesses as to what I might have chosen, let's start with who I would have chosen modern actor to recast Quigley with. Uh, uh, Jim, who would you guess I would recast Kit Quigley with? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think I think part of the problem is that there aren't a lot of actors like Tom Selleck, um, and, and that was my problem. I'm sure you have a good one. Uh, I. I I know I have I have a couple, but I, I have no idea who you would. Uh, choose. Devin, any guesses? Uh, for you, or or what I would think. For for me. Uh, let me think. Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> <laughs> He's just mocking me now. So, no, uh, <laughs> I, I went with all right, all right, all right. I went with Matthew McConaughey for uh, Quigley. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, no, I think that's I think that's a great uh, I think that's a great pick. He's he's a little bit older than Tom Selleck than forty four now, right? He's he's got to be early. 50s. I know. Well, I don't I don't know, but I will say I, I did do these recastings five years ago, so it's Fair. probably it's probably close. Um, but uh, before I get to your choice for Quigley, I do want to point out this scene because I I, I think it's this particular moment is interesting because I think we're starting to explore. Uh, the, the masculinity theme that I mentioned earlier, and here particularly exploring the competitive nature of masculinity, the alpha dog syndrome, if you will, which I think is a big driver for the Marston char character in the sense that I think he specifically wants to deal with the deserters here in a way almost for Quigley's benefit. You know, Quigley just demonstrated his skill with a gun that is something that Marston can't do. So I think Marston feels a little, you know, envious to some degrees, and he feels the need to prove himself. So, you know, I think that's what this moment is all about for the Marston character. Um, and I, I will get to your recasting choice, Jim. Uh, anything, guys? 
Yeah, I, I think this is setting up what becomes an ongoing conflict of the entire story. The conflict between these two men and how they view masculinity and how they view power. And ultimately, the way Alan Rickman's character views power is just brutality. It's just straight up, you, you, take, you take the power. You, you, you show that you have the power with your, bruta with your brutality itself. Uh, obviously, that plays off uh, Quigley's view of power and masculinity being yeah, much I, more smartly centered. I would argue that both men, and it's not, it's not contrary to you, it's just wording it a little differently, I think. I would, I would argue that both men define their masculinity according to power, but it's power that they define differently. For Quigley, his power resides in his weapon and his skill, possibly his smarts and his moral code as well. For Marston, it's about money possessions, and to some degree his reputation, which is where Quigley might be the biggest threat of all. Marston yes. needs Quigley's particular skill to complete a task, but a part of Marston can't stand that Quigley is so much better than he is at something. That combined with the mythic qualities normally attributed to the American West makes the goal of eventually besting Quigley way too tantalizing to reject. His ego can't let it go. It's what defines his manhood. And if you look at guns as phallic symbols, uh, uh, re therefore representative of manhood, as they often are in Westerns, then quite simply, Quigley has the biggest gun. Yes. And, and this yeah. is fascinating because to to play off that into this scene, which is such an interesting scene, this little duel of wits that they're in. One of the best scenes in the film, I think. One of the top three. I agree. I agree. And their performances are, are both excellent in this scene. And they're, they're, they're playing, without playing the academic side, they're covering all those necessary elements in terms of the, the, the themes of racism and colonialism that run throughout this story. Obviously, some of it's just the way it's directed, uh, having that that character um, who's the servant, who's the indigenous character, um, kind of standing where he is and coming in just just every so often to pour for each of them. But also the way that, that each of these actors with their eyes is deciding how to use that other character as they duel with the other. From a writing perspective, and I'm going to talk about the indigenous character in a second. From a writing perspective, uh, it's, it's really impressive because it's so expositional, but it's done with, you know, it gives us a lot of historical information, but, they, but there's so much subtext and nuance going on. And this is the shot. This is my favorite particular shot. Winsor chooses to go away from these men delivering exposition and having, you know, this duel of wits and focus on this indigenous character, you know, across the table. And, and it holds on him for a long time. This character has no lines. He doesn't say anything. He's, he's theoretically tangential to the scene, but really he's not. And I think it's a great choice by Winsor following him here. But overall, there's so much subtext, history, and exposition in the scene. But you don't feel the exposition because it's so well performed and because I think of all the subtext. Um, Jim, we haven't heard from you in a while. Yeah, no, um, I, I think the great thing about these performances is that as we define um, as, as we define Selleck as being supremely confident and relaxed and owning his self and owning his identity, um, Rickman goes this completely different, you know, he attacks through insecurity. His character is all about uh, being insecure and measuring himself about uh, against other people. And that is exactly what uh, Quigley is not doing. Um, Quigley does not feel the need to to go out of his way to to try and uh, you know uh, uh, have a contest with other people. He knows that he is completely satisfied being you know what he regard you know as as he regards the best at what he does. Marston is um, is completely insecure by seeing somebody else that confident and owning themselves. And I think you can see that in every every eye movement that Rickman makes every. You know, from the moment that he came on in the previous scene and uh, just the sideways glance and the constant measuring up that he gives of Tom Selleck's character, uh, even all through this scene. Yeah, and you would think that Alan Rickon would out act Tom Selleck, but to Selleck's credit, 
he is right in there with every every beat of that scene. He yeah. doesn't have to say much, but you talk about Rickman's eyes. I, I give Selleck and I, Alan Rickman is a much better actor than Tom Selleck. I'm not saying he's not, but Tom Selleck was right there in that scene, beat for beat, with he Alan Rickman. He really was. He completely held his own in that scene, and I think that this turning point of of you know being tempted by the trappings of cooperating with the powers that be, which is Marston in these in these parts. Uh, and him passing that test with gusto uh, by throwing him out the window. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's obviously this this fun turning point, which is very much a, a good old fashioned Western turning point. But but all of the interplay between them leading up to that. And now this beautiful shot with the, you know, the um, that that is that that is representative of being on the straight and narrow that gun that shot in the foreground with him having just confidently, calmly having thrown him out the window and now he's just sitting there with his gun. Right, and, and but it's like the way, that, yeah. the way the shot is framed with the gun in the foreground like that, it is sort of coming from his torso, sort of reinforcing that phallic idea, which, you know, like, is, I don't mean to say to be funny, I actually think it, it is connecting the, the weapons to this concept of masculinity. I, I also think you're seeing a man supremely okay with, you know, whatever comes out of this. You know, he's, right. he would rather choose this way to go. Right. Well, I don't know if he, he'd choose this particular yeah, way. particular way, way, but. I think he was hoping way, for a better The way that he was thinking. <laughs> yeah, he definitely underestimated that uh, indigenous uh, Australian servant. Um, you talked about Alan Rickman earlier, and, and I don't want to let it go. Uh, he was also in, I mentioned earlier uh, with Devin that he was in my top five supporting actors in 1988 for Die Hard. I also had him in my top five supporting actors of 1990 for this film. I think it's a delicious performance. I had him right behind Joe Pesci in Goodfellas and John Polito in Miller's Crossing. Whenever I see Alan Rickman, his vocal quality to me is always like syrup on a large stack of pancakes with butter, making something good even better. I just love the way he delivers lines and the sound of his voice and how that affects his lines. Um, his motivations are economic in the, on the surface in this film, but I think there's a deep pain inside him that Rickham, Rickman makes palpable combined with the very male sense of insecurity that Jim talked about that fuels some of his more questionable decisions. And this is what happens if you don't play by the old power rules, you get dumped in the wilderness. Right. So this is this might be a good time to bring Jim back because I, I didn't let him. He had some ideas uh, that he wanted to best my Quigley idea, although I don't think he'd do better than Matthew McConaughey. He's the best. You, you know, um, so so I want to go back to say it, it is very hard. We, I don't think Hollywood really produces actors like Tom Selleck uh, much anymore. Um, but uh, I, I will say I, I thought about it. Um, I'm going to throw a curveball at you, Jonathan. I, mean, I hate when you do it. Uh, it, it's okay. It, uh, I, I, I would say, uh, you know, I think Bradley Cooper is is the obvious, but I'm going to say Josh Hartnett. Okay, I and I and I asked you only to do one, but you snuck another one in there. I, I did, did. I did. I snuck another one in there. It's like, you, know, I can't it. you, know, you get a demerit for breaking the rules. Josh I, Hartnett is just not as good of an actor, and, and he's also, I think, still too young. He might be in his forties, but he looks so young. Um, I think Matthew McConaughey brings a little gravitas, and, and the way that McConaughey and Selleck they 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 share that confident walk. Now, you know McConaughey in some of his movies might be more of a swagger, but look at him in a terrible movie called Free State of Jones, and he can adjust that for the period. I think, um, Devin, uh, what do you got for Quigley? Modern actor recasting. I would say that if this were made today, and and came at this story with all the extra uh, zeitgeist that 2020 has, as opposed to when this when this film was made. I think the perfect choice for Quigley is Brad Pitt. I think that in performances in recent years, such as obviously Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but also Ad Astra and a couple other films, Brad Pitt has established himself, obviously a little darker, than than Tom Selleck, but that kind of like I said goes with the zeitgeist of of the decades that have passed since this film. I think though that there's something uh, connecting what Selleck brings and what Brad Pitt would bring in the sense of that awareness, that swagger 
of, of confidently knowing, hey, I'm a bit of, a, of an asshole too. I've done some horrible things in my day. I, I am not Mr. Nice Guy by any stretch of the imagination, but I do have a moral compass and I'm here to, to, to you know, take names because of that. And I think that there's a, just a quiet power uh, that Brad Pitt uh, is really in his, in his prime now delivering that would really serve this story well. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, my own, my primary concern is that, I mean, Jim talked about McConaughey being too old. Brad Pitt is significantly older than both McConaughey now and also Selleck uh, in 1990. Um, uh, you know, so I would, that would be my first concern. And I've been, I was very critical of Brad Pitt in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But when I really thought about it. you were it, wrong about that. Yes. <laughs> um, but when I really thought about it, I would say that, I mean, I think it's a terrible movie and a terrible performance. But. Brad Pitt was not was in my number one movie of 2019 and my number one film of the decade. It's two separate movies, so I, there is something about Brad Pitt uh, that that keeps creeping up, certainly in the roles that he chooses. And uh, and I, I loved him in Ad Astra uh, that you've already brought up. As did um, I, I, yes. I, do, I, I do think that he is. I, I think he's probably he, he, surprisingly to say this about Brad Pitt, but too long on the tooth. He was working back during when this movie was initially made. So I, I actually think that might be might be too old uh, for that particular character, but- um, But again, to update it to the zeitgeist, 55 is the new 45. Maybe, maybe you might. Uh, I'll take your word on that. Um, all right, so there's no way you guys are gonna, I have a, sort of an out of the box choice for, uh, to, to re, we haven't talked about Core very much, but to recast Core with a modern actor, um, I've sort of the out of the box choice. So I'm not gonna get have you guys guess because it's so unusual. Um, I went with the uh, I went with Amanda Peet, who I think is a highly underrated actress, who I, is is obviously gorgeous, but I think her career was sort of derailed to some degree in the sense that she kept getting all the gorgeous roles. And I just want to point out how great this particular scene is. This holding on one shot here, um, sort of, I, and I think it takes great chemistry uh, between the two of them, uh, you know, and good comic timing. Uh, it, it, upon rewatching this film again, I wonder if their chemistry as the story and the relationship evolve isn't the biggest differentiator for this film. Uh, and I think it really it comes out in this scene, which is all almost all one shot, um, almost theatrical in that sense. Um, and I think this might be the element that raises it from a good movie to a particularly good movie, their chemistry as their relationship evolves. Um, and it's, it's the chemistry and it's also so much about this cinematography. It's just establishing this motley pair and, and how in a way with the costume choice, when you were seeing them in silhouette from behind earlier in the sunlight, they resembled a proper gentry couple from this time period. Um, even though they are, they've been cast out and they're in the wilderness and they're anything but a nice proper gentry couple right now. It's so, it's so beautiful to have that as the sort of background uh, archetype, ar archetypes of what they're playing on top of the circumstances that are actually happening. And, and Windsor does a really good job, uh, along with the actors, of communicating the extreme heat of the desert. It's not too dissimilar from a sequence in Lonesome Dove, which he also directed, where they had to ride 80 miles without water. And, and I, you know, to back to David's point about the gentry, I mean, there's a lot of pleasantly recycled material in the film, homages to the Western as a genre, but their relationship in particular feels different from a lot of other Westerns. And I think it helps make us care a little more about these characters and, and therefore the film itself. Yeah, there's a, there's a beautiful homage to Technicolor here, just as Quigley has his vital turning point making the decision to do right by the damsel in distress rather than just scavenge her ammunition which is his first instinct because first instinct is survive 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 yeah and then this moment of wow wait i can't do it i can't do that and so so much color in these shots so much of a of a homage to those old school uh, you know, simpler classical uh, films. And also to some degree a celebration of this area uh, of Australia. I think, I, I believe this, I, I don't know for a fact, I did some research. Um, 
uh, and I've never been to Australia, but I believe this is uh, all the desert stuff is filmed in a place known as the Red Center near a town called Alice Springs. It gets approximately six inches of rainfall annually. It's basically right in the center of the country in what's known as the Northern Territory. Um, but to, to circle back, guys, because we got distracted for some of the cool uh, this cool desert sequence. Um, Amanda Peet, guys, uh, super talented actress who uh, is gorgeous. Um, oh, I, did, I do want to point out this frame too, I, as I go away the from British Amanda are Peet. coming. The British are coming. This frame here is pure John Ford with Marston silhouetted in the foreground. That is right out of John Ford. Um, and you know, Devin just talked about some of the Technicolor homages, or I think what he meant to say is homages to you know when Technicolor was first being established in the 50s and used heavily in the westerns, especially in the widescreen format. Um, so guys, uh, uh, Amanda Peet is an actress that, that is gorgeous, but she can bring uh, uh, so much depth to a character. And I feel like that aspect of her as an actor got, got sidetracked or over underrated um, by a lot of the pretty girl roles she had to play when she was younger. Uh, I mean, I, I really do love Amanda P. I think I think it's a great choice. Again, I, I think with like Matthew McConaughey, like like Brad Pitt, I wonder if she's if she's not a, a little bit too old. I mean, she's got to be what, late forties, fifty. Oh, I don't think she's fifty. I think she's she close to her. a little up there right now for this role. I would agree, but otherwise, great choice. Yeah, she has that raw intelligence uh, that really again I did this five well. years ago. It's, it's fair, fair. Five years ago, five years ago, Amanda Pete, perfect. We're and getting I that think, time I machine. Uh, I think, I mean, Devin's, you know, much older than us, but Jim, I think she's around our age, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, real quick, guys, do you guys have some chorus as we see uh, Mr. Marston here? Uh, so I do, I do have a Cora. Um, Samara Weaving. See, I, I think you, she's, Untested, uh, you know, I, I really liked, we did the film on the show, Jim and I together did Ready or Not, and I was impressed with her. I think she's way too young. I think Corey needs to be certainly, you know, somewhere in the 30s. Uh, she she is the same age that Laura San Giacomo, uh, Laura San Giacomo oh. was uh, when she filmed this. Interesting. I also don't know if Sarah, so, I mean, I'd be curious. I would test Samara Weaving for the role. She was impressive uh, in Ready mm -hmm. or Not. I'd be willing to test her. I'm not convinced she could pull it off, but I wouldn't have been convinced from, you know, that Lara San Giacomo could pull it off before seeing the film. So I, I'd be curious to test her, but because uh, I, I watched that miniseries Hollywood and I thought she was terrible in that, but I thought, you know, but that's, that might be Ryan Murphy because I think she was good in Ready or Not, as we said on that show, episode 56.1. Devin? Uh, this is a tough one off the top of my head. Um... Well, I don't want to waste time if, if it's off the top of your head. I mean, if you don't have somebody. No, uh, I don't. Um, this is a good time to talk about some of the history of uh, indigenous Australians, since we're seeing, we're gonna have a sequence with them here for the first time. Um, the term Alan Rickman uses in that uh, dinner scene with Tom Selleck was pacification by force. And that was a real policy. The indigenous were outgunned, but they often used guerrilla type tactics to kill their invaders or ruin their crops, a uh, harvest or other economic interests. So the indigenous were fair game. If one retaliated or damaged British property, the British would hunt a full group of them, regardless of whether the perpetrator was a part of that group. Uh, Britain arrived in Australia in 1788 and claimed the land by virtue of terra nilius, which is Latin for empty land. They considered em it empty because they didn't consider the indigenous actual people. There's obviously racial implications here, but it also had something to do with their lack of technology and sophistication. And also the indigenous Australians didn't really have a concept of land ownership. So technically by British not law, it wasn't owned at all, ergo fair game. When the British arrived, some estimates have the indigenous population at somewhere around 1.5 million. By the time this film is meant to take place less than 100 years later, that number was already down to 100,000. Now, obviously acts of colonial terrorism had a lot to do with that, but so did unintentional means like the diseases Europeans brought with them, like smallpox, flu, pneumonia, things that the Brits were able to cure, but in some cases, the indigenous didn't have the means. So guys, just, I just want to provide a little backstory on or context about the history of indigenous Australians and how it relates to the film. Absolutely. I, I, I think um, th this, uh, this sequence coming up is a really interesting uh, parallel with Native Americans, like you were just mentioning, but also 
how how much better equipped it, it becomes this philosophical statement here about when you're less equipped to deal with an invading uh, people like a European colonial power, you're actually better equipped for relating to nature and surviving in the wilderness. And so there's this interesting mixed relationship here with the, you know, the white man and white woman who are part of that in, sort of invasive uh, power. But since they're not representing that, since they've not made that choice, it's this tentative mixed relationship where they get to share some of their uh, better, better Culture. equipped nature with, with, with surviving in the wilderness. Yeah. And I, I just want to call out, there's a, there is a terrific moment for Larson Giacomo right here. Right, this, she's about to have a line through the eating of the bug that I think is, is pretty hilarious. Right now, <laughs> it makes me laugh every time. Uh, good, good to shoot yeah. it first. I think it's that is a great moment for her uh, uh, and a great moment for the screenplay. Yeah, uh, Larson. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Devin. No, it's, it's a nice comic relief here, uh, which has been long overdue for for a while now. In this, yeah, 10, 15 minutes or so. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, it's a nice reversal of what we we would normally see. Uh, you know, uh, you get something like Raiders of the Law, uh, uh, Temple of Doom, with right. Kate Capshaw when she's in, uh, you know, the chilled monkey brains, and here you have Laura San Giacomo going all in, and uh, Tom Selleck being a little bit. Which is a decent segue to, and I can't believe we talked about her very much at all. But Laura San Giacomo, uh, you know, it's a decent segue to to her. She actually made my top five actresses of 1990, albeit in a distant fifth place in a year that had two all-time great performances like uh, Kathy Bates in Misery and Meryl Streep in Postcards from the Edge. Um, I, I think she uses the mental Ill illness, uh, mental issues in a believable way. Uh, we're about to discover any second now that this character is suffering from an extreme version of what we now call PTSD. And her character's va vacillations between states rings true to me in spite of its occasional use as comic relief. Furthermore, I think as an actress, she pours herself into this part. She really commits and goes all out in what I find to be a very satisfying way. Um, she's got a beautiful monologue coming up that, I, that I, I'll point out when we get there. It's, it's a, just a minute or two away. Um, that I'll talk more about in a second. But before we do, guys, Laura San Giacomo in general. I mean, I think she's great in this film. Um, I, I also really love the way that it, she plays this person with uh, with a mental illness that is not, you know, it is it is not, it would be very easy to be crazy all the time in this role. And I yeah. think that that is, that would be the wrong choice. And that it's, it's good to see that, you know, just because you have a mental illness, it doesn't mean, you know, you, something can break you and and we can you know as as we're going to see as as we will see um but uh but it doesn't mean that you are you are necessarily off all the time you can still have this this normal interaction that, you know you can well, go about your life until it moment, comes up again before moment i say anything deep. deep about laura san Giacomo, i just want to not miss the opportunity to mention speaking of comic relief the last few minutes of this movie were so much, so much resembling the Peace Corps sequence in Airplane. <laughs> uh, you know, they were they're sharing their different methods. De Devin's like, our comic relief on this particular show. So <laughs> <laughs> plays the crazy core apart. So here, um, here is the monologue that I was referring to earlier, and, uh, and Devin got his comment in just in time. Uh, this, to me, is the kind of monologue that actors dream of. And if the movie was more popular, I think it would uh, it would be a common audition piece. And uh, Devin, I think your much younger girlfriend should use it if she could track it down. I think it's an ideal audition piece if actors knew about it. Most of the monologue is done in one shot. And I want you to watch her very carefully now as she seems to visualize the events that she describes. And I also love this terrific choice that she has of this knitting that, that she's doing it. And at one point during the story, she will drift away from the story and talk about the knitting and then back to the story, which is another, I think, great, 
great moment and choice for her, whether it was improvised or whether it was in the script, I'm not sure, but it, she executes perfectly. All this is one shot so far, guys. Um, and so even at some points, she slightly rushes the monologue, um, which suggests the lack of comfort at even thinking about this difficult time in, in her past. It, um, it also makes it so much more real. It's not, it's not acting. She's not yeah. acting this very deep remembrance of this traumatic event. She is having a very real dissociative experience uh, that, that, that this is how it would play out in real life. You're, she's, she's just, she's dissociating and, and because she has to, and it's just facts the same way that the petticoat that she's mending is all about pragmatic facts that are right in front of her. She's yeah. just decided I'm telling this story and this is exactly what happened. And then my son got taken and blah, blah, you know, all that is just very matter of fact. I also think the, now that we finally left the shot, that how absurdly beautiful she is in this moment when she's revealing her greatest trauma mm. is such an interesting uh, choice. I, I don't think it's by accident that, that she's, she's being lit and, and shot in this way that makes her look beautiful. I mean, not just beautiful in a, in a, you know, attractive way, but beautiful, at almost um, like a 13 year old girl. She looks so pure. And Angelic. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, it's out of this world. And you, you and I, I think both you know, ha have uh, a tendency to fall for the vulnerable types. So I think, you know, that as she becomes more vulnerable, she becomes more attractive to both of us. Jim hates the vulnerable <laughs> types. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, think, I think it's not only a brilliant monologue. I haven't audited the entire uh, Lars San Giacomo catalog, but I, I think it's very possible this might be the high point of her career, this particular moment. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant acting piece. And I, I also, I you know, while we're here, I just want to say what what a lovely uh, choice to not give Tom Selleck any lines. That there is nothing. There's no words of solace. There is just he's just has to t quickly has to take it in and fade out. <laughs> and he does a great great job of listening uh, yeah. as well, which is you know actors don't do enough of to to that point. So he didn't have lines, but he was still present in the scene. Um, and that and that scene, I think, is a. Uh, is a good segue to talk a little bit about the one of the things that separates this film from other westerns, I think, and, and that's its uh, sort of sub theme of, of mental illness or PTSD, as we talked about, and recreating history the way that that she does, you know, by substituting Quigley for Roy. That's a very real symptom of severe PTSD. So when Quigley comes to a rescue in the beginning, it provides her an opportunity to reestablish trust with someone she has admiration for. She sees Roy in Quigley because her brain can't process the reality just yet. And it's not just the loss of a child, it's the complete lack of compassion by a supposed loved one, Roy in this case, and the abandonment that came with it. Now in Roy's defense, he was likely suffering from something similar and he dealt with it in a vengeful way and putting her on that boat, which further contributed to her temporary breakdown of mental facilities. So I, you know, as far as, you know, 1990 was not a time where they were dealing with mental illnesses in, a, in a, always in a sophisticated way. And you wouldn't expect that in a, in a genre film like this, but I actually think it's a very mature handling of the, of the, of the subject matter. I agree. I, I think that it's, there's something so, so sweetly sad um, about it and sadly sweet about it that she calls him that from the beginning, because it's, it's accurately portraying how someone in that scenario is using this other part of their brain. It's, it's, it's almost like an Alzheimer's patient who is um, able to connect with people with music and other emotions, even if they don't know exactly where they are. And it's like, she's in that PTSD state where someone, a man like him, who she can tell right away, just with her lower brain, with her primal awareness, instinctually, she can tell he's a good man, he's a strong man, right away, her brain just associates that with the name Roy, her husband who's no longer with her. And, and she, he's probably, Quigley's probably better than Roy. She probably, you know, she's probably what he imagined Roy would become or was when she married him, you know what I mean? And Roy wound up being yeah. not, not that. Um, and anything on that, uh, Jim, before we move on? 
No, I think that's completely right on. Um, and uh, that that Cora, I, you know, she has all of these I, I, ideal fantasies of what her husband would be, and, and Quigley is the person who's probably living up to what those those are, so that she can easily paste Roy onto him. Yeah, she, um, she can fill that empty space that that she now has in her psyche. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there are a couple different directions I can go now, guys. Uh, I could talk about the film's role in the evolution of the Western, and we still haven't talked about Simon Windsor and and his his sort of career and and how it plays out in this film. Do you guys have a preference of? I'm leaning towards the Western right now, given where we are in the movie. What do you think? Yeah, and go go with Western. Uh, all right. So the film's role in the evolution of the Western. Quigley, generally, uh, you know, and when we meet him, is a mercenary of sorts and a loner which fits in with the revisionist Westerns of the late 60s. But Quigley's moral compass is more in keeping with the reflective Westerns of the 50s that Devin's re referenced a couple times with the cinematography. I think of characters like James Stewart in The Naked Spur, A Broken Arrow, and I think you can draw, draw a direct line from Quigley to the TV character. Oh, I, this is a great moment, by the way, on the horse when he touches her hands. I, you know, I think it's just, it's very subtle for a film like this, and I think it's sort of, their relationship evolves so beautifully, tender and kind of nuanced for a movie of this nature, like like that moment. It's it's subtle, almost as if he's surprising himself how much he cares for her. He's established that kind of a soft spot for the underdog, and her story her story I think really got to him, guys. Yeah, yeah, and it connects again to that same sweet, vulnerable uh, uh, vibe we have here in terms of you know here's the crazy quote unquote crazy character uh, saying anyone who believes in magic is crazy when she was talking about what the uh, indigenous people were saying. Yeah. yeah. And that, that same sad reality uh, of what happened to her that made her crazy is the one that she now believes in is, is reality more than the quote unquote magic of a more optimistic or happy worldview. Um, it's, it's, it's so, that's so terribly sad. Um, and it's it's I think it's what's driving her to wanna to wanna just be quote unquote practical and and connect their bodies right now, which then he um, he resists. But right, which I, I would have a hard time doing myself. But you know it's been a while for me. I, you know we've been locked up for a long time. Um, I, as I was saying, I th you know in terms of the western, I think you can draw a direct line from Quigley to the TV character The Rifleman, played by Chuck Connors in the late fifties, early sixties. Although obviously The Rifleman's Rifle itself was a little bit different. Um, the revisionist Western heroes were a little more selfish, representing the growing distrust of community and government in the 60s, the move towards individuality, individual expression, and every man for himself. Quigley tries to be a loner, but I think his arc displays that, that he might not, that might not be in his true nature, especially as his relationship with Cora evolves, like in this scene, not to mention his relationship with the indigenous people. The revisionist Western also uses a modern style filmmaking with quick camera movement, extreme camera angles that call attention to themselves in a satisfying way, I grant you, but that's not what this movie is. This movie owes more to John Ford and possibly Anthony Mann, the sweeping vistas, the mix of humor, the more traditional angles and cutting style, and its meditation on racism and masculinity are right out of The Searchers or The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. And now he, here's when he's realizing he made a terrible mistake. Yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> little leg. <laughs> that, that, uh, that ought to do it. <laughs> but yeah, he, I mean, he was tempted by, by this false consent of a woman who's not really thinking straight. And just like all the other moral tests that he faces in this movie, he passes the test. Um, and now he's, he's reconsidering and he almost sort of doesn't pass for a second. <laughs> he's going to wait for the better prize in the end. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, it shows a lot of courage. Um, so, so guys, yeah, I mean, I think as, as far as Westerns are concerned, it's interesting because I think quickly he, you know, you know, you look at Westerns like Will Penny or Shane and quickly is a character that you, that you would, that, that, you know, is like them to some degree, but, but those guys, Shane and Will Penny feel like they're, they're a cowboy even Monty Walsh, to some degree, which is a character that Tom Selleck would play for some Simon Windsor later in his career, uh, he's a character that that they feel like they are cowboys, and that's all they can be. They cannot, you know, as as the world moves past needing cowboys, as that as that world progresses past 
them, making them almost extinct. You know, Shane and, and Will Penny and Monty Walsh, they can't be that. They can't adapt to, to uh, the oncoming world. And there's something fatalistic about that. But I get the sense that Quigley is different from those, especially, you know, his relationship with Cora makes me believe that if he doesn't start that way, by the time the film ends, he, he that's where he becomes. Anything on that, guys, or anything about the, uh, the role in the evolution of the Western? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there was there were a couple things wrapped up in there. Um, I do agree. I think that Matthew Quigley uh, does not define himself only as a cowboy. I don't think he would be he'd be stuck uh, in a world that moves past him. Um, and, and I think definitely by the end of the movie, he'd be willing to start a new life. But I think that is that is who we've always seen Quigley be somebody who is supremely OK with himself. And, yeah, you know, and that, and and that, that is, is where real power lies, or yes. you know, at least that might be the one of the morals of the story. Um, so we we never really uh, got through the uh, the Alan, we just missed Alan Rickman. We we never did his recasting. Um, so I wanted I mean, to give you guys an opportunity. I I have a sort of not an out of the box choice, but I I have a choice that that I think is that you might find kind of intriguing, especially if you're, if you're watching this movie with a sharp eye, um, Jim. Who, yeah. Who, I mean, I, I mean, there's only one, I, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one person to cast in, into the Marston role. And, and yes, with a sharp eye, I, I it is somebody who is cast in this movie. Give it away. I think you're on what I've got. I think I, I, it's uh Ben Mendelsohn. Um, ben Mendelsohn is exactly who I have. <laughs> yes, Jim. I, uh, yes. The, the bad guy du jour of today uh, would be perfect re replacement here for the bad guy du jour of then. Uh, and he is in this movie. I, you know, I, I, he hasn't come up yet. Uh, and we'll point him out if you haven't noticed him. But he's very young. He play, He's Australian by birth, Ben Mendelsohn. But he actually plays an Irish character in this film. He's the young guy. We just saw him trying to shoot the uh, practice his aim. Uh, Jim, did uh, not Jim. Devin, did you notice that was Ben Mendelsohn? I did not until you guys pointed it out, but now I'm totally on board. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll point him out to the audience when we get another opportunity. Um, he, he he's gonna he plays into the plot uh, shortly in a in a major way um, or towards the end of the film. But uh, but yeah, he I mean he's a great bad guy as we've seen in many films, including uh, Mississippi Grind. Uh, he's sort of a bad guy. Bloodline, of course. Uh, Rogue One. And sort of a red herring bad guy in Captain Marvel. He's a terrific actor. Um, and uh, by the way, I just want to point out that is not a real horse that fell in that moment. That was a, that was a stunt, like it was a fake horse sort of stuff uh, with with some moving parts, uh, almost like a puppet. So no horses were injured during uh, during this scene. But it's it's a cool shot. Um, but, but those indigenous people, they actually did fall to their death. They 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 threw them off the cliff. Is that is that not is that wrong? Well, back in 88, that was fine. <laughs> it's terrible. You guys can't see Jim. He's shaking his head in disgust. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was all going so well until that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, it's, it's true. It was going well until then. Um, I, and I, I do want to point out Simon Winter has been recognized throughout his career. for uh, He's got a, a ton of movies with animals, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, but he's they've always been safe. He's been commended in his career for that. Um, and uh, so this movie is no exception. There, this was a very safe movie for people and animals. No indigenous people were hurt or animals uh, on on this set. Um, okay, so guys, uh, right. yeah, sorry, sorry. I don't know. Why I'm apologizing to Devin. <laughs> um, I guess that's a that's you a guys good thing. Kill the joke. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. J Jim's conscience got the better of him. Um, so let's talk about Simon Windsor for a bit. Um, as I did a lot of research on Simon Windsor, uh, watching a lot of his older films in order to prepare for this uh, commentary. And so I want to share some thematic commonalities I saw in, in some of his films. Um, well, first of all, he's Australian by birth, and Australia itself um, was a, a big part of, uh, of his oeuvre, particularly the connection between Australia and the Western world. And by that, I mean America, Britain, Ireland. Quickly Down Under might be the most obvious, but also his horse racing films, Farlap and The Cup, um, 
both Lightning Jack and Crocodile Dundee in LA sort of deal with the connection between America and, and the Western world, uh, Australia, I mean, and the Western world. Um, and Westerns, the genre itself, he's done a ton of Westerns in his career. Uh, this film, as well as the TV films, uh, Monty Walsh again uh, with Tom Selleck, which is a remake of one of our 1970 films with the original starred uh, Lee Marvin. Uh, but they would they would make that again in 2003, uh, Tom Selleck and Simon Winsor. Um, and of course, Simon Winsor's masterpiece is, is The Lonesome Dove, uh, the television miniseries, uh, which won him the Best Director Emmy of that year. Um, he also participated in the 2006 TNT miniseries Into the West. And I would also argue that his film from a, uh, a year later, I think, Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, although it took place in a modern day setting or actually a slightly futuristic setting, it has all the archetypes of the Western just without the setting. Um, he also did some kids movies, um, Operation Dumbo Drop. His biggest success at the box office would be Free Willy in 1993. And of course, Daryl, um, D-A-R-Y-L, um, from 1985 or six, I believe. I think it was five. Um, and he worked with animals a lot, as I said. Operation Dumbo Drop, we talked about Free Willy. And we've already talked about Westerns, and we had all sorts of horses, and he did not one, but two horse racing movies, Farlap, P-H-A-R-L-A-P, which is a name of a famous Australian horse, and The Cup, which is about the famous Australian, the Melbourne Cup, the most one of the most famous horse races in the world. And he also made The Young Black Stallion. So he's worked with tons and tons of animals, especially horses, uh, in his films. Um, you know, so uh, in terms of his career strengths that I've noticed that, that Winsor has as a director, uh, and one that we've seen a lot throughout this film that Devin sort of pointed out a couple times is landscaping, uh, landscapes in general. And I suppose you could argue that's obvious in some of the more material that he does, but he finds a nice aesthetically pleasing geometry in a lot of his vista shots, whether it's a period piece like this or something more modern like Daryl or Harvey Lee, or Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. And he also does a really nice job of letting scenes play wide on occasion. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a beautiful, gorgeous wide shot. Talk about geometry and vista shots, using the character and the in the wide shot, in, the, uh, in that gorgeous shot of Quigley at the top of the cliff. Um, he lets scenes play wide uh, often uh, in letting actors, you know, move within the frame. Um, that, that often really works in his films. Use of foreground a lot. Uh, we talked about the gun in the foreground in one of the earlier shots, uh, sort of low angle shot. His use of music, I think, is really strong. He seems to know exactly how and where to use it and either enhance the emotional impact or gently move us with characters through some sort of transition. Um, some weaknesses I've noticed in some of his films, sometimes he walks that line of manipulation when it comes to pulling those heartstrings. And even in this film, uh, particularly at the end, uh, it's, the emotion is totally earned in something like Lonesome Dove. This and most of Daryl, the very last Daryl, I think is a little on the weaker side, too much, for example. But Free Willy and the Cup maybe had too many moments where it crossed the line from hitting home to feeling a little, little contrived. Um, so, guys, I have some more. I also want to talk about Daryl a little bit, but uh, anything that, about some of the things I said about Simon Winsor? I, mean, I, I agree with everything you said. I, I, I think that we're probably all in agreement that this isn't exactly a, a tour de force of, 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 of brilliant cinema. Um, it's just a darn good movie. And, and so everything that goes with that in terms of, you know, cool shots, entertaining, interesting moments, interesting storytelling, but also some minor missteps, also some areas of, of sentimentality that starts to go slightly over the line. Um, her finding I, I, this other child uh, to take care of in place of her son. I mean, that's a screenplay thing, but it's, it's slightly contrived, of course. You, yeah, and that's, I was about to get to that, this particular moment, and I'll get to it in a second one after I bring Jim in. I will, I agree with the sentimentality. I disagree with one thing, and I would argue that this is maybe slightly above a good movie. Uh, I think it's like a well, I said a really good, good movie. movie. <laughs> I mean, like almost like, I think it's a movie that's almost great is the way I would put it. Like, you know, or just shy of great, like, you know, a okay. minus maybe for me. Uh, it's it's and it, you know that's really hard to do. 
I mean, Lonesome Dove is a is a masterpiece. I grant you, but this this film is really really good, and it because I just feel like it holds up every time I watch it, and it surprised you again, Jim, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, to be fair, uh, like I said, I I had almost no recollection of this movie, and I was I was honestly more distrustful of myself uh, as as a younger viewer watching this. Movie oh, me too, and, and liking it. And I, um, I think that's how I started. I said I never thought in in a million years that it would make my top ten again. Twenty, you know, back it, when we did this five years ago, it was twenty five years later. I didn't think it would still be my top ten, but it is because I it's a movie I remembered and kept coming back to and just really thoroughly enjoyed. I was impressed with the depth, the combination of entertainment and depth, I think is, I wish more movies were like it. And I think that, uh, and it's by, and it's a really hard thing to achieve uh, harder than some of the more maudlin movies that get Oscars like, you know, 12 years a slave or, or something like that, you know, like to balance out the entertainment and the depth, I think is actually a harder thing to do. I guess I, here's my can, can I throw you a question, Jonathan? Yeah, because I, you say it's, it's an almost great movie. And I think I think we're all in agreement that the performances in this movie are rock solid, like from the leads. They are great. What do you think? Is it, is it the director would 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 a different director have been able to take this from an A minus movie to an A plus movie? What um, what do you think it needed? Probably, but I mean, like, I really like a lot of Simon Winter's films. I, you know, I said I was going to talk about Daryl for a second, and I, because I, I rewatched Daryl last night to prepare for this, and it really holds up. And and so I'm, you know, between Lonesome Dove, Daryl, and this, I just feel like Simon Winter is a really good storyteller. And I mean, what it impresses me about Daryl is it's really three movies. It's a sweet family comedy drama, then sci-fi, then chase action, almost like. 40 minutes each for, or maybe even 35 minutes each for each of those, those three different movies, but it all, it's all, he manages that same tone and entertainment value. And I'm really impressed when a filmmaker can take something high concept and unrealistic, like the concept of Daryl, which is for those who don't know, is about a boy robot. Um, and he makes it feel genuine and real. And it's an entry in the subgenre of the eighties that Devin and I talk about a lot, not on the show, just privately. We're that nerdy. It's a, it's a <laughs> genre that I've called preteens in peril. Other examples might be Explorers, Space Camp, War Games, Cloak and Dagger, or the film that Devin and I went to see in the theater last year that led us to discussing the subgenre, Flight of the Navigator. And of course, the godfather of the whole mini genre, E.T., which we reviewed in episode 53.3. Um, I don't think you've seen Daryl, Devin, but uh, you have, Jim. Oh, are you kidding? I, I, <laughs> Daryl is one of my favorite movies growing up. I yeah. mean, again, another movie I haven't seen in probably 30 years. But right, but I, and I had neither, but I, it was really impressive because I, I, and I, maybe there's a nostalgia factor that make, that makes me, uh, you know, enjoy it a little more, but I, it's, but I don't know, but because I do think it's good storytelling and by playing some of these big, larger than life circumstances, by playing them real, I mean, basically you're taking, you know, Winsor didn't, you know, directors are interpreting scripts more often than not. So he's handed the script, and and so he is involved in these choices for them to play it straight. That scene that we all love with Alan Rickman, you know, like, the, I, you know, would a different director have have gotten those same performances? I don't know. Um, that the, those same moments. I yeah, I think that there. I don't know if I would trade a different director. I I would love to maybe, you know, whisper in the ear of Simon Winsor back in 1989 when they're making the movie and and say maybe hey maybe this moment might be crossing the line cuz i think that's the only you know thing about the movie that uh, we're about to get to that one of the one of my movies issue is is coming up uh, when we cut back to Cora it just barely to me flirts over the line of contrivance and manipulation in, in some of these moments and you know what that that the whole thing with Cora in the cave that we're about to see is is something of a uh, it's a screenwriting thing too. So I don't know if Winter would have changed that. Maybe it's a script thing ultimately, because um, here it's it's our going back to our 1980 interview. It's this is sort of our, our cry in the dark kind of uh, uh, scene coming up here. Uh, uh, the, the purposely exaggerated romantic moon there is one moment that's going a little bit over the line. 
No, you're right. You're right. But I mean, and, and but that's the thing. So when uh, Jim asked about trading directors, like I don't know if I want to trade in all the good moments, you know, in order to fix, you know, what oh, I, I, I completely agree. I, I, a handful yeah. of bumps. A handful I of bumps. Agree. I, so you know, here's the scene coming up. Dingo supposedly aiming to eat a baby, a la Cry in the Dark, which was would have been fresh in the minds of most audiences because it was just two years before this. And uh, Devin and I watched it with Alex for our 1988 review. Um, and it's a chance at redemption for Cora. Um, and it's, it is contrived to me. Although I will say, Jim, to your point, it's a really well shot and edited sequence. So what I see a director doing here is maybe almost being aware of how contrived this is and, and almost shooting it with a quick cutting and, and the shots of the dingoes, almost shooting it to see if, in, in a quick, you know, almost actiony style, to see if he can sell the contrivance or 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 bury it to some degree by making this moment work, and he just misses, I think, because I, I wish it wasn't so dead on. But that's a screenplay thing, and and I don't know if it if a d different director changes that or just argues better to 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 have the script changed. I I don't know. Yeah, Jim, that's my long response. I mean, I think I, I think that's fair. That's uh, because I, I I mean, I do agree with you. I think it's it is it is a, a really really good film, um, and there are just some things that are just a little off. And yeah, you know. I, I think for the most to, to me, I think our answer is just in these thirty years, our culture has shifted so much. That's exactly that. why I wanted to remake it five years ago. Like it, I just yeah. felt like, it, you know, there was a handful of moments, and also I just thought it'd be fun to do. Like I, ha I have so much fun watching it. Uh, you know, I would love to revisit the world of Quigley. At the time when I was young, I was hoping it was going to be like a franchise. I think Tom Selleck hoped that as well. Um, so I, I really think that it was, uh, you know, I, the idea of remaking it was to iron out some of those spots. Um, and but, you know, but I think those spots are not so much, I, I think, as you were sort of hinting at, JB, I think those those spots are not so much flaws in the filmmakers themselves. They're yeah. just simply a product of, in 1990, this was the way our culture would tell this story and would tell it well. But you're, now, you're, you're, 30 years you're later, right. we would alter this story because we've gotten so much more cynical with the with the, with the, the types of of mini stories within stories that we choose to tell we've kind of gotten more sort of sophisticated but in a way that's also just just more jaded and i think, I think that that's why some of these stories don't, don't get told i don't think this film would get made today you're well i mean westerns are a hard sell already you know let alone western takes place in australia um you know and don't forget crocodile dundee Crocodile Dundee 2 and A Cry in the Dark all made Australia sort of a country du jour at the time. So, you know, that, that certainly helped to get this film made, let alone Tom Selleck was rising uh, as a star. And also, you know, before we get, before I forget, I do want to point out something that's happening in this scene right now. There, the music in this particular scene, it's interesting. I don't mind the choice, but it, it seems to undercut the danger at times and almost make light of it uh, as if assuring us that Quigley has this whole thing under control. Like there's danger. And then there's these sort of like slightly comic moments that are only comic because of Basil Poldoris's score, um, which I think is really, is, is really interesting, uh, interesting choice. Uh, I, I think there, there's uh, a couple comic moments coming up here where he's going to jump into a, a roof or something. So, guys, anything on the score moment, real quick? I think it's a it's a product of 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 a smart director saying, "Okay, look, we all know this. It always comes down to a shootout and a fire. That's the genre we're in. So we all know it, and let's just embrace it. We know he's going to do this fine. We know he's going to carry us through this just fine. So." I'm going to give you that music that that shows it's like this meta commentary that he's making while we're watching that mm. that he knows we all know we're going to get out of this 
Um, and and that's that's what I think he's doing with that choice. I, I wonder whose choice it was, uh, you know, uh, or I have wondered, you know, historically, uh, you know, because it, you, it's such a bold choice. You would have to think that it is something Simon Windsor asked for, as opposed to something like Basil Poldoris just came up with on his own. Because they had, you know, he also Basil Poldoris also, or it could be Basil Basil Poldoris also did Lonesome Dove. And here's one of those moments that I was talking about. The music is a little light here, you know, in the middle of this action scene. Uh, and it, it feels like something sort of you, you know, unique tonally. So it, it, it feels like something that, that was requested because it, does, it doesn't seem like the obvious choice. You think if you're a composer, you sort of start with the obvious and then branch out from there. Uh, Jim, anything on this, this sort of tone of this particular fight scene? Yeah, yeah. I, so, I, I think that I think I have two theories, uh, and it did strike me as really weird in that moment when I saw it. And and Devin, what you were talking about, I think it, maybe you're right, and maybe it's a way of just saying this isn't the climax of the movie, guys. We need mm -hmm. a way just to pull the pull the stakes back a little bit, and um and just let you know let people relax a little bit and let them just enjoy the process of this fight. Rather than getting too invested, you know, we, let, let's not get them all tight and worried about Quigley right now. We still have another big sequence coming up really soon. So. It, it's not the climax, but it is the, basically the second act plot point because it is the point after the scene. Well, I mean, after the the tragedy that I think that, that uh, we're we're gonna find um, that that causes Quigley to to shift the 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 playing grounds, if you will. Um, yeah. Once once this scene happens, Quigley turns the tables and comes after Marston. You know what I mean? So that's sort of like the second second act plot point that br that brings us into the third act. But um, but the yeah, other especially idea because I have, we have the killing of an innocent that's worth avenging, and so he's got to step yeah. up and. and well, it's not you know it's not the first innocent, so maybe the first white innocent, but there's been lots of innocents. That, well, that, absolutely, but I mean, in terms of him deciding, okay, that's it, uh, Marston's done. Right, right, uh, right. Well, I'm just saying, script structure-wise, I think it's an important scene because it's the second act plot point. So, it's still interesting that they they would have some of these lighter moments that quickly shifts to tragedy. But I mean, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's sort of skillfully done. I, it, it's just a surprising choice that I wanted to point out. Yeah. And it sounds like Jim, you were surprised too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and to circle back to what I was, I was saying like to Devin's point. Yeah. I wanted, that's a, I wanted to remake it because I wanted audiences to experience this story. And I worried and not knowing your guys experience with the movie, I worried you guys were going to have sort of the cynical approach to this movie and not appreciate it. And I'm glad that you guys did as here is that tragic moment that I think we were just talking yeah. about. Um, what a shot and, with him with the fire on one side oh, of the shot. Great framing. So yeah, I don't know if I would trade Simon Winsor in, you know, like I, I, I just wish that there were a couple choices he would have done differently, but, um, I, and I don't know if I, I don't know if I would have done as good a job. I hope so. But, uh, but there's a lot of great choices that he makes. But uh, but yeah, so also, I mean, like, also, I would, Jim, you get your you get your wish here because uh, the little boy, Josh Hartnett. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so yeah, I wish that uh, the I, I I want the story to be experienced by people. Like so, in the, I would almost I was nervous to show people this movie, especially younger audiences, thinking they would quickly dismiss it. So I thought if I remade it with some of Devin's cynicism that he's talking about. You know, then I might be able to get audiences to experience it, uh, you know, without being too judgmental about it. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to remake it, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Um, so cool. So, I mean, as uh, as we're getting back to Marston for a little bit here, we, we haven't seen Marston in a while. It has been a bit. Do, do you miss uh, him, JB? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I miss Alan Rickman in general, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> You know, just an absolute terrific actor, and I mean, what a loss! Way too soon we lost him. Uh, you know, the most of the other cast of this film are are all still alive, but uh, just Even, very sad. Yeah. Um, 
Although even so, more important than Alan Rickman returning to him, we get to see his beautiful, beautiful rug here. Yeah, and he, he definitely points it out too. He um, does, he says, get this guy out of here. He's gonna bleed on my rug. And really who can blame him? Yeah, yeah. Um, I want, uh, it's funny, you know, it's interesting that, uh, you know, Windsor made three films that I absolutely love growing up and still do, Daryl, Lonesome Dove, which is of course a miniseries, and this. But three films that are also considered the worst of their year, Lightning Jack, The Phantom, and Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. Although I watched Harley Davidson two nights ago, I loved it. So those critics can eat me. They clearly missed the point of that film. I highly recommend. It was a nice surprise. And another example of Simon Windsor being very good at the, within the Western genre. Jonathan, I want, I want that as a poll quote. Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. The other critics can eat me. Jonathan Bessler. <laughs> How bad Billy Zane was in The Phantom. I don't blame Simon Windsor for The Phantom as much as no. Billy Zane is the main problem with The Phantom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw Phantom in the theater. I completely agree. The failings of that movie lie squarely with Billy Zane. I just want to circle back about mental illness here, you know, because we're talking about some of the issues that we have with the film. I do feel like this whole arc of hers, and this is my one of the hiccups I have with the film, is a little simplistic when it comes to PTSD. And as sophisticated as the film was for its time, and it's dealing with mental illnesses, a shot of redemption like she has would likely help, but it wouldn't be as much of a switch as I feel like it is. Like it's a you know almost like a light switch. We we kind of never see the crazy Cora again after this. Or, and she's after acting the a little talk. crazy right now. I mean, she's acting cute, but I don't think she's that crazy. But point being, like, it's borderline because you know, given the scope of the film, it might be enough to you know, like, you, for the arc. But if we stay with the characters past the life of the film, it would be unrealistic to assume Cora doesn't have further episodes especially given the lack of proper mental health care at the time and now, actually. Uh, so you'd think there'd be some relapses uh, as, I, you know, this, this, Devin talked about the gentry shots. This is, I think, the idyllic, you know, especially with the new dress uh, and quite a makeshift family they've created. And here. now baby makes three. Yeah, even if it is family, it's a nice makeshift family. So, uh, so yeah, even if it is temporary, I should say it's a nice makeshift family. Um, so, De Devin, I think this pl this shot plays into exactly what you're talking about. A lot of it, all in one shot again. Yeah, and there's something so so real and sweet about about their their building connection by this point in the film. They they genuinely care and worry about each other. And then what what a pretty shot as they approach this welcome shoreline after what they've been through. Yeah, this uh, that shoreline I believe was shot in a place called Apollo Bay in the province of Victoria. It's an it's a coastal town not too far away from Melbourne. I think two ninety minutes, two hours away from Melbourne. And Apollo Bay is known for its whale watching. That's one of the uh, claims of fame for for Melbourne. Oh, not for Melbourne for Apollo Bay. Excuse me. Um, and you know, this is a really interesting scene as far as Cora's character is concerned. Yeah, I mean, because now they could just be back. They could be settlers in the Old West and mm -hmm. everything's fine. And they're just trying to figure out what to do for the farm. <laughs> oh, you, you mean with the framing of that particular image? Yeah. yeah but it's just them, since they're now indoors and they have have this so there's so much in common between the old west of, of the US and uh, and Australia. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I mean and you know, I think this this also is is really interesting as far, and I don't think it's I also think it's important that this character is German here, the the uh, the older saloon it's not saloon it's general store owner guy. Um, it, it sort of adds to the it's, it's historically accurate and, and sort of adds to the texture of Australia at the time, sort of this also similar to America, sort of a hodgepodge of nationalities coming together and trying to you know, start a new life. Um, and I mean, this is, you know, this is sort of, you know, the end of Cora's arc, sort of like the, the, the period, if you will, 
on, I mean, we'll see her again at the very end, but uh, her character journey sort of ends here. And, you know, the symbolic giving away of the baby, it's, it's, it ties up the core storyline, but also the indigenous Australian storyline to some degree as well. Um, sort of connective moment there, um, you know, because it talks about, you know, the, a peaceful relationship. It sort of displays a peaceful relationship between indigenous and, and you know, basically white people, um, people that are hoping to be, you know, become Australians, native, you know, uh, you know, in terms of as the country builds. And also, you know, the symbolic giving away the baby, just sort I, of suggesting her yeah, letting go of the past, letting go of the past is what I wanted to say. Yeah, and I think those moments were another uh, display of what a strange, strange career Laura San Giacomo's had. Yeah, um, you know, yeah, this she, film, what, you would have think that she would have, like, she would have come a big star out of this film. I mean, she did Sex, Lies, and Videotape the year before, so her star was on the rise. And then Pretty, uh, Woman. Pretty Woman, she had a supporting role. So, I, so like, you know, like you wouldn't necessarily know that she was gonna, she had, she was leading potential, but a great performance in this film, and yeah, it didn't, it didn't pan out probably the way she had in mind. She switched to TV in the late '90s for Just Shoot Me, which is not a show I watched very much, um, you know, but it was on for four or five years. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, if you watch this movie and this movie alone, you're like, this, you know, this movie's, this woman is a, is a star. You know, she's she's a star in the making. I think she has the skill. She definitely has the 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 charisma and the skill to be a movie star, to be a yeah. leading woman. Uh, but I think, like so many, there's there's I mean, there's so many variables. But it's I think with her, you can see it in this performance. Here she's being there's a sweetness, and to some extent, she'd already been pigeonholed as the sex pot. You know. Yeah. The cute sex pot and here she's just the cute sweet one with depth and hollywood's like what which one are you maybe i do like the score for this movie i think it fits the movie tonally there's a lightness to it like almost whimsical basil Poldoris, he had a lot of interesting scores in his career paul verhoeven was another frequent collaborator with robocop and starship troopers though Paul Doris did not do Total Recall, which was Verhoeven's 1990 movie. But my personal favorite of his scores actually might be for a, a below average movie. It's a baseball movie though. For Love of the Game from director Sam Raimi with Kevin Costner is a really good score. And that's that's another Basil Paul Doris score, but not much from him you know, after that. Like after the 90s, he sort of trailed off. This by the way is I think a beautiful and appropriate callback coming up uh, and so, subtle and a great it's cinematic because it's so visual and i mean it's it, the this information was released about 30 40 minutes ago so it's not like doesn't feel on the head i think this is an example where he does not go over the top i think this is you know just right in terms of the emotional content of the scene and, and what it evokes i agree it's that that's why we watch movies is for is for those kinds of moments and it's okay that it's right up on the edge of, of being overly sentimental because that's where the sweet spot is. That's where the magic happens. And, and also perfectly played by Laura San Giacomo. Just, she did, you don't need to be big there. It's, it's that understanding what it is and acknowledging it. And that's all it needed. I will say it was a treat, a real treat to see her again in Honey Boy just last year. Devin and I saw it together in the theater. Um, and when, when she came on the screen, he actually put his hand on my knee. So I knew then <laughs> that uh, he'd, be, he'd be a good choice. <laughs> that's every time we go to the theater. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Devin, I hate to tell you, Jim does the same thing. Um, <laughs> Only when he careful, gets scared. Only when he gets scared. Very careful framing, like making sure to keep the indigenous Australian in the frame in, the, in this particular shot. Uh, you know, like I think that's a very subtle and purposeful choice you know just keeps it in mind you know character doesn't have any lines but it sort of keeps him in mind because you know he will play a big part in uh in this and theoretically and one also represents what he controls he's like here's my power i control all of them right but i mean i also like one would presume that the very ending that we'll talk about uh 
you know, you know that it, it's set in motion with this character being there uh, and potentially, you know, letting uh, others of his kind know what's what's about to happen at the Marston Ranch. Yeah, but I but I do think it's also again representative of here is here's my uh, here's my 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 goods. I, I have the goods, like the, the material wealth, like the rug, but then I also have, this is my domain. I am master of, of this particular indigenous person, as well as all the rest in this region. Right. And, and him staring towards the camera or staring towards uh, where he knows quickly is emerging from the top of the hill with that awareness. Here's my guy in the frame next to me. I control this. Jim, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's so there's there's a whole bunch. I also think that it's you, when you have the indigenous person standing at the corner, it's, it's we're also being reminded that there is this this population that is all around, like that mm -hmm. that they're they're they are there, they are they're present and and witness to all and, of this, and often ignored as like you know, nobody speaks to the character or acknowledges them in the frame, uh, but. But they're definitely absorbing and, and I, present. Yeah. Uh, and this is a interesting uh, tactic here from Marston. Inc incredibly questionable and vain tactic, if you ask me, for him not to allow the men to sleep. Um, he relies heavily on their expendability. Like so many good villains, like like the Darth Vader type. I mean, yeah, I guess so. But I mean, like we get the impression. By the way, there's Ben Mendelsohn for the audience. This here is Ben Mendelsohn, a young, red-haired Ben Mendelsohn, uh, that would now play Marston in Jim and my version of it. Uh, my version would be better because I I think McConaughey and Amanda Peet are going to be better options. But uh, I you know I think that uh, you know I think we're at least we're all agreed on Ben Mendelsohn who. Uh, I, I like the circularity of him playing, you know, the sort of the uh, toady, would you call him, or sort of, you know, like a secondary villain to the main villain. And, you know, he relishes those roles uh, Ben Nettleson does now. Um, so I think he'd, he'd love to do it. Almost so homage to Alan Rickman. The right-hand minion becomes the main leading villain. Well, he's not the right hand. Look, he's like the bottom of the totem pole here. Even in the framing, you can sort of, he's pushed to the back here on the left hand side. But of the in frame. recent years, he's been the right hand minion. Has he? Has he been the main? He's been the main villain. Ben More Madison. than the minion? I think so, Jim. Don't you agree? Uh, yeah, he's definitely uh, the main villain now. And By so the way, this, I love this shot. I, I know, uh, I know, Jonathan, you're going to want to talk about, about yeah. uh, that. Yeah. So but I, he just killed two men with one bullet. And to, to this day in the army, that is called pulling a Quigley. And that's a true story. And so you can see that this original script that became a movie in 1990 that didn't do super well at the box office. Um, Jim saw it on cable, it sounds like. I guess other people did too. It, it's had its own legacy. Unfortunately, more relating to guns and violence. But I think so. it is something that, that found its way into the vernacular somehow at least in, in certain circles. So I, I, I thought that was a really interesting tidbit that they that, that little moment, which is a great moment where he kills two guys with one bullet, but it's now called pulling a Quigley, and I thought that was a cute little tidbit. Jim, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I, I just love I love the reverse shot of that when they like, oh, well, where'd that come from? And it's just the entire mountain. <laughs> just, yeah. Just this is all dangerous. <laughs> this whole – I often talk about why Spielberg is one of the better action directors – and it's 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 because he's always showing you the geography and and you're always aware of the off-screen space and that's what makes great action sequences and this is an example of exactly that almost spielbergian in, in the sense of you're aware where characters are in relation to one another so it, it increases the tension um and this shot in particular this wide shot you're you're you get the whole sense of where they are in relation to one another and then so when they cut close you're not disoriented um, I, I think geography is really important to action sequences, and this is a great example. Uh, and for those looking to be action directors, I mean, you might want to go to Raiders first, but I mean, this is, I have no fault in this scene in, in how it deals with action, particularly when it comes to action in a Western. Yeah, it's great how, how Marston's circle of influence is shrinking, and you see it physically shrinking with each of these moments. 
because we see the mountain become half a mountain, become a third of a mountain, you know, as, as quickly moves in and, uh, and encroaches on their space. But, but uh, like, even as these guys are falling off the horses, you saw them riding and from a distance. So you understand that they, the, the, the uh, terrain was steep. So that it makes sense that, that they would, they would, they would be on a decline. Whereas if you just cut to the, the medium close up uh, of them falling, or, or even like the, the, the what they, what is called the cowboy shot, like knees up. If, if, if you just cut to that instead of that geography shot, like it would, it might seem a little contrived or just like convenient that the, that the terrain was there. But by showing you the wide shot, it all plays and makes sense and is logical. You know what I mean? Yeah. Jim, what do you think about this action scene? Uh, I mean, I, I, I love it. I love the 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 little the, when he waits for them to make sure that they're following, so that he can then in the very next sequence you're like, why would he do that? Oh, he's setting a trap. Like it's 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 doing a great job of just telling you, um, uh, of leading you into the action and telling you why he's doing things and what he said, you know, what they're setting up for next. Yeah, I do have to say though that pulling a Quigley sounds like the exact opposite of what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it should be like, you know, when Laura San Giacomo was, was working on the petticoat earlier, like kind of pulling a piece of string out of the cloth, like that should be pulling a Quigley. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I you know, we're different audiences too, you know, because I think, you know, like none of us are real big gun people. Um, in fact, I think you, I think we're all sort of uncomfortable with them, even though I, my dad was a cop and, and we had one in the house. Um, I was never really like interested in it or obsessed with it of, uh, uh, in any way. So I think, you know, I, I'm a little bit bothered by people looking at this movie and not bothered, but I mean, like, I'm, I feel like they're missing some of the larger points of the film for them to be like, oh, that rifle's cool. And which maybe it is, but like, who cares? And like, oh, and it is cool that he shoots two guys with one bullet. You know, I mean, like, it's not like a common Western, you know, yeah. uh, motif or or, or trope. Um, it was, it's a cool, almost original-ish moment. Uh, so, like, that's great. Uh, but I wish the film was known for more. I guess. Yeah. Jim, do you own a gun? <laughs> I mean, I shot, I shot trap for years, so I, I have a shotgun. Um, but, uh, but it is, it is very much locked away and very seldom used now that we have children. Three of them now. Three of them. Devin, um, I didn't mean to, I mean, like I, if you're a big gun fiend, I, I just made an assumption that you might be a big gun. fiend. <laughs> yeah. Only fully automatic. So <laughs> are you a 44 kind of guy or I don't, I, I don't really know the differences. I mean, I, 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 I have no idea and I have no interest. Jim, you're a nerd. You might know more about guns. But I, I mean, it was sort of incidentally. Um, I, I will say, I think it's the, the, the trope of like in, in these Westerns, you normally have the guy being good with the pistol. And that is, you know, we don't normally see two guys shot at once because they're a revolver and it's easier just to take of the course. two shots. Of course. Of course. And so I think that the fact that we have the rifle is is as the primary weapon for this guy is right. It's fun and, and interesting. I really I also want to point out Tom Selleck is being that is Tom Selleck um being dragged there at 44 years old. It's kind of impressive. Uh you know, like Normally, you don't get to do a, a, a close a shot that close of your hero being dragged like that, but that, that's a luxury for Simon Windsor to be able to cut in to a medium close like that while he's uh, while he's being dragged because you know it just it, it adds to the verisimilitude to be able to see the actor being dragged. Uh, I I Devin, you guys are both actors. Would you, would you have done that stunt? Uh, he was about the same age that that. Uh, Jim, you're at now, and Devin, you're at about 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> um, I, I, it looked fun to me, actually. 
Yeah, I mean, one hundred percent. You have an uh, you have the opportunity to do that. You take it. Yeah, you know, because they, they would have I, I, all I, the precautions and they'd have yeah, the and whatever. I mentioned earlier Simon Windsor's record for safety was was very high. One of the best shots in the movie. This shot, I think, so many directors use overheads too often. That to me is the perfect time for it. I think it's one of the only overheads in the film. Uh, you know, sort of diminishing. Uh, D diminishing the character of, of Quigley for a second because high angle shots diminish a character, low angle shots sort of raise them up and make them look more important, bigger. And, you know, they, a lot of younger directors will overuse them, but uh, I try and teach them restraint, you know, pick your, pick your moments. And I think that is a perfect moment for, uh, for something like that. Yeah. And now here so comes here the ridiculous duel that's, uh, yeah. Virtue signaling as it. if it's a real duel that's actually fair. It's sort of a precursor to Gladiator, you know, when he stabs him before they they have the fight in the ring. Right. Uh, so yeah. he, he knows he's slow, slowly bleeding to death. So he's here. He's he knows he's been weakened and dragged, and so he's like, "Oh, here's a quote unquote fair fight." But but his vanity is going to ignore that because that's what this is really about. I think is Marston's personal vanity like as we talked about before he disguise he defines his masculinity by being the best or at least convincing himself he's the best so he sets up this seemingly rigged dog and pony show over a man he's already beaten because he needs to convince himself of something prove his manhood to himself and i think what we learn from quickly and the, the power that he has because that's where we keep coming back to power is perhaps being a real man quote unquote is not necessarily needing to constantly prove it. Jim, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, yes. And I think what we're seeing here is it is it is uh, it is a little bit of the cycle of Greek Greek tragedy here. We're seeing Marston uh, uh, with hubris, and then of course Ate, Divine Madness. <laughs> you know, it's a fine, it's a fine line. You know, I mean, we. Well, it's, we, you know, Huber, he's he's you know the, the hubris has been there from the beginning. This is, you know, by deciding to go in on this, by deciding against the the, you know, that he has to make this a test, that he has to win in in some sort of fashion. Um, this that is, is depth, that is the depth of the insecurity. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. And, and I mean, so we, you know. I think it. I think it rings true because you know we see it so often in smaller ways in real life. How insecurities, uh, how much they de they define people, even people we come across with in our working life or, or social life or even dating lives. Um, as uh, as Quigley uh, takes care of uh, takes care of events here, um, yep. in uh, in a pretty convincing way. And you know this whole standoff thing does come. Is very much, especially like the one on three, uh, is right out of the spaghetti western. But uh, Windsor resists the need to like do the extreme close ups or the or the you know the high angle low angle shots that, that uh, Sergio Leone would do. Um, I think he showed some restraint in setting up that showdown. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I I think that insecurity is is very believable. I, I think you know those of us sitting on the outside might uh might say like well that's logically stupid but given how rickman plays the character i think it tracks and i i can see people i know that are deeply insecure about one thing or another i can see them going to those, those lengths especially if they can see the opportunity to prove something like you said devin he already had the uh oh, devin you uh oh yeah um he already had the advantage but he was going to ignore that and basically set up something where it looks like he defeated the great Quigley. You know what I mean? Right. Yep. I think this ending with the Marston servant, I think explains his behavior earlier. Like he had been domesticated almost as if he had forgotten or perhaps even unwittingly betrayed his heritage. And Quigley's victory inspires him to reclaim who he really is. And I think he... He, without a word, this character has an arc in this movie, uh, which I think is is very poignant and, again, speaks to the cinematicness of this movie 
you know, and using visuals to communicate something that's kind of evocative. This is a beautiful moment here, uh, you know, just spiritually, uh, you know, in, in terms of reclaiming your heritage in, in this way, I, I think it's, it's very emotional and I think it works very well without anyone feeling the need to explain it to us, you know, yeah. aside from us. That aside from us right now, like obviously. Shackles. Yeah. But that's it. I mean, it, and it, it speaks, I think you're, you're exactly right. It speaks to how far like subjugation and oppression can go and how deep it can run. And then finally, you know, taking the step to, to reclamation um, is, makes that so powerful. Yeah. There's a great simplicity to it. Also, one of the places where this film benefits from being 30 years ago instead of today is that it, it, it does better to have that simple moment. He's not, there's no discussion, there's no delay. He just makes that walk and sheds the clothes as he walks. Devin, you, do you want to throw in your and line? Now the British are coming back. The British are coming back. <laughs> it's like just Tom Selleck to reacting to your joke as much as he was to Ashley Pitt. They, they to Ashley Pitt. Um, I would heard, uh, the, the British are like, hey, we heard some. We heard some subju subjugated people were just released. We can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Devin, to your point, I often find, even when directing, that most often the cinematic choice is the is actually the simplest choice. Or maybe I, yeah, it's the other around. The simplest choice is often the most cinematic choice. Is probably the better way to say it. Um, and I think another way this film benefits from being 30 years old, to your point, is it is... The substance um, defines the style rather than vice versa. You know what I mean? Like more often than not, I feel like, uh, you know, the style and why I'm sort of down on a lot of modern films or more or a lot of today's films is the style seems to o overshadow the substance or, the, you know, directors will often force a, a style or uh, a, a, a flashy style onto a piece instead of it, it coming from the piece. And I think the choices here come from the emotional beats, you know, the camera choices and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, further as we, in the last 30 years, we've gotten a little more away from that, I think, just in terms of storytelling and uh, cinematic storytelling. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, the, you go back and look at the most powerful moments of this film and they're all, they're, they're, they're almost all stillness and silence. It's, it's the, the, you know, her monologue, the the gun in the foreground, you know, Quigley the moment before he takes the the ammunition and then takes takes Laura San Giacomo uh, of uh, of the of him uh, recognizing it in in his eyes, um, and when he leaves uh, to go back to go after Marston, that that moment when he stops and looks back, it's all they're all understated. They're all they just let it play, you know. And Simple that's what makes movie. that's what makes this particular moment so disappointing. At least the touch of the wind, the choice of the wind, I felt like was a little much as this sort of harbinger of of this moment with the indigenous Australians. I think is is a beautiful moment, but that the touch of the wind, I think, is is one of those little things, those little bumps. Uh, and I just want to point out these are not special effects. They filled those hills with indigenous Australians, um, which is I think is very very cool. Um, Great rack focus here moment. Uh, but I, you know, like that that wind that sort of foretold what was happening, you know, was a little much for me. Like I didn't need that sort of spiritual uh, you know, nod or whatever. Like I it just it it takes it took away from the moment just a little bit for me and sort of, you know, veered over that line that we talked about uh, um, in terms of manipulation. Devin, I think you're on my side on this. Yeah, it's it's a it's a minor minor little step. Oh, so minor! Yeah. But it just happened to come up while D Jim was talking about all these understated moments, um, which I you know I, I found unfortunate because <laughs> yeah. I think it, was, it just so happened to be one of the uh, one of the more one of the less understated moments uh, at that well, particular thing. I oh, think, uh, that that was a rare not. that was a rare performance error. That that the head of the British there was a little obvious. With yeah, shift. but I mean, like, but he's in keeping with the wind. That the whole wind and the dust coming up, and then, and you know what I mean. Like that was a little, 
yeah. it was all a little heavy handed. And, and so his reaction fit with that. I think it's all weak, but the actual concept and idea and some of the shots that featured the indigenous people in the, in the distance, I thought were gorgeous. And then this, this turnaround where they're gone, I think is, is, is quite nice as well, or it's about to happen. I like coming back to this one guy uh, too, uh, the servant. Yeah. I think that's really good. And here he is now, you know what I mean? He's a free man again, a little hobbled, a little worse for wear. And this beautiful, beautiful shot here, this high angle. But what's great about his Vista shots is the people, the characters are, are a part of them. It's not just about showing scenery. It's about showing characters' relationships with the scenery. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And that's something he did in, a lot in, in, uh, in Lonesome Dove as well. So I don't remember getting a, uh, you know, a reaction from you guys on my boasts. And I know you guys didn't watch all the movies of 1990 that I did, um, but I said that uh, I had Laura San Giacomo as my fifth best best actress of 1990, and Alan Rickman is third best best supporting actor. Um, bold claims. I'm sticking with them after even after watching as many movies from that year as I did. Uh, guys, what do you think about those comments? Oscar worthy, Laura San Giacomo and, uh, and Alan Rickman. I mean, I think both of them do a great job here. Um, I, I think, I think when you put them into context, I think because because even you said there are there are better performances, and in, in this year, that's um, true. But, other but I, I do have these as top five, which would make them Oscar worthy. I I think they're up there. For me, I you know I I don't know I I'd probably have to go back and really go into the movies of 1990. I'm going to say they're they're great performances. I, they well, they, they were probably all, in the mix. You can do for, them all as second runs. All of the 1990 movies. You did one with me. You did Air America in one second run. That was a 1990 movie that you did with me. I like Air America. It's a good movie. What's that? I like Air America. It's a good movie. You liked it better than I did. I didn't think it was that good a movie. I think I think Tom Selleck envisioned this as a franchise, as I mentioned, and quite frankly, uh, you know, that's that's another reason I wanted to remake it because if there was a market for westerns, I think Quigley's Adventures in San Francisco, San Francisco, where he's supposedly going now, or anywhere else, could be interesting and entertaining. And I'd love to see Cora in those as well. These are characters I really enjoyed getting to know, and I feel like, you know, they there is potential there, especially given his skill set. Um, that 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 could be a very entertaining series, whether it's on television or a series of films. Um, certainly, westerns on TV were something that was very common in the 50s and 60s. So maybe it was it was it would have been worked better there. You guys, you have seen more Quigley films as we get a slow motion into freeze frame here. <laughs> just, we did a lot in Lonesome Dove. See, I don't, I don't know. I see this story feels complete to me. I don't know where you go. What the sequel to Quigley Down Under it would be is? A whole different story. It, it wouldn't be Quigley Down Under. It'd be Quigley searches for gold in San Francisco. Or, or, this is past <laughs> the gold rusher. You know, it would be the, the next Quigley. Quigley in Dodge City. You know, uh, you know, Quigley for hire. Like who knows? Um, uh, Quigley PI. <laughs> See, I like I like the idea that that he is going to you know the, his next life with Cora now begins. I don't, you know, I think if we if we give him another movie that takes him away and makes him an adventurer again, it's uh, you know, I, I, I don't I don't know. I I think this is it's a good complete story. It's a good whole story. Yeah, I mean the, the whole... same way that he left her and looked back. You know, in the in the third act of this, that could happen again in the first act of the next one. It would, or it she would be, could be she could be along for the ride more. Look, just as long as they don't do to to Cora what they did to Franca Patente in the Bourne movies. Yeah, exactly. We wouldn't want that. Uh, it would be a whole different story, and I and I, I he's a character I enjoy watching, so I would, I wanted I wanted to see more of it. A little as you see the credits here, a little bit on. Uh, MGM, which is the studio that released the film, at, you know, during the 30s, it was the biggest and most successful of all the studios, The House of a Thousand Stars. The Wizard of Oz actually was very unsuccessful at first and a major financial hit to the studio. Um, of how successful Gone with the Wind was in the same year. 
Um, so uh, Louis B. Mayer let go of a lot of his major actresses in the 40s after losing all the money in Wizard of Oz, and the studio started to go downhill with the occasional hit keeping it afloat. In the 70s, Kirk Corkian turned it in, into a hotel company, but after they merged with the United Artists in 1991, they went back to the movie business. Ted Turner bought the company, then Corkian got it back a year later, and then in 1990, it sold to an Italian financier named Giancarlo Peretti. So that's the status of the company at this particular time. And so perhaps they weren't able to give the film the support it needed to do a little better at the box office. Incidentally, Peretti was out of the company two years later after charges of securities fraud. So MGM has bounced around ever since, but it's still kicking in its own way, far from its glory days from the 30s. But at the time of the film release, it was a lesser studio. It, it was in major decline. And, and maybe that speaks to as why this film didn't get the push that maybe it could have. Um, because it's, you know, as we all agree, it's a good movie. Um, guys, anything that you want to close out with us with credits roll in this movie? Yeah, that's I. You know, it's I'd love to see the alternate universe where this was uh, like a breakout hit. You know what what happens to the careers of these actors? I mean, uh, obviously not what's his bucket, but Alan Rickman. But um, were you gonna say what's his bucket? Yes, I did. Of course, I said it's my thing. Okay. All right, we got Panavision uh, logo coming up, so I gotta let Devin speak real quick. <laughs> I agree. I think it's one of those weird happenstance moments in cinema history. I think this could have done so much better. It probably was something to do with the marketing campaign. For I think 1990, who was really ready for this story at that point in the culture? It was still a little bit too far from the classic Westerns to just match them and say, here's another one. But it also hadn't been long enough, like if this film were made last year, that it could be this whole other commentary coming at it from such a distance. Instead, it was this little in-between for audiences in 1990 of people saying, what, a Western sort of? It didn't exactly check off the, the checklist for uh, this is gonna this is gonna hit and be a box office smash. Well, it did. It did for me at the time because my dad and I were there in the theater opening weekend. So I, Devin, Devin didn't realize that the credits meant that he had to stop talking. So I, you guys got to say a real quick goodbye. Goodbye, audience. Goodbye. This Thank was you fun. so much for watching our first feature length commentary. We got many more to come hopefully uh, in the in the coming months. Hope you guys are all doing well and staying safe. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and watch our regular review show, The No Name Cinema Society. This meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is now adjourned.